Well, welcome everybody. I hope there's some audio coming through. I know that came through a little light on my end, um, maybe a little too light. But anyway, I, we you're here to hear Vinny Chir Chir Sarluzzo, and I hope I got it right, Vinny. I tried anyway. Uh, well, today we're going to hear his tips and tricks for dry hopping IPAs. From not, I mean, from the guy who invented the double IPA, and I think to a large degree has crafted the American IPA, uh, and, and along with some other West Coast brewers, but certainly Vinny has led the way. I'm Doug Piper, and I'm the host of the Gourmet Brewing Channel, and I'm in Greenville, South Carolina, kind of warming up here, and it's beginning to get more like summer than spring. Thank you so much for taking time to join us because we strive to make your day more delicious one sip at a time. Now, please share in the chat if the audio and the video is okay. I'm going to move this thing around a little bit so I can see the chat. Just let me know. Henry says it sounds good. Jeff says audio good. Yes, we have audio. Awesome. Drew Beecham says, wait. Is there beer to be had? <laughs> yes, <laughs> but you have to bring your own. Uh, but this is going to be a lot of fun. Now, please share where you're viewing from. Would love to see there on the chat. I know earlier I saw Volker, and I hope I didn't pronounce it wrong. I'm sure it did. He, he's in the Netherlands, uh, actually out of Germany. So please share in the chat where you are. The chat's a great place to uh, get to know everybody in our audience. Uh, but let's bring on Vinny. I know you're not really here to see me and I don't blame you. So let's see, Vinny. By the way, I am learning a new feature on this platform. So if things seem to go a little bit slow, <laughs> as you know, I am a little slow, but uh, it also is the uh, platform. So Vinny, thank you so much. I appreciate you joining us today. Thanks. It's good to be on. It's taken a while for you and I to connect. Uh, we saw each other in Nashville at the IGN German Hop events, but uh, I know we've been trying to do this for a while. So th thanks yep. for making time. Well, thank thanks for letting me twist your arm a little bit and remind <laughs> you in Nashville. <laughs> that was fun. Well, listen, Vinny, I'm going to take you off screen for a minute, and we're going to talk about some of the logistics right quick. We'll get back to you in just a moment. So please consider writing in the chat to let Vinny know how much you appreciate his volunteering quite a lot of time with us today. Uh, he and I have chatted probably an hour, uh, kind of getting things set up. He's going to spend maybe as much as two hours or maybe a little bit more because we're going to follow up with a Zoom call. So those of you that can stick around at the end, hopefully at least briefly, Vinny can join in. Also vote in the polls. I use the polls extensively uh, to kind of shape what upcoming webinars and things are. So those of you that are Patreon supporters, I ask you, uh, those that are on my YouTube channel, I ask you guys, uh, I wanna know, I wanna bring the people on screen that, that you wanna see. And our next one is Lars Garshold, and he's gonna be in July. Uh, coming up, we got Vinny, so let's bring him up on screen. And I want to tell you a little bit about Vinny. Uh, whoops, Vinny, I did not mean to make you full screen. Let's see if, see if I can get the buttons right. Uh, I bet not. No, I did not. Move to the main screen. There we go. I promise. There you go. Hopefully, I won't make anybody seasick with this. I'll try. Uh, Vinny Cerluzzo is a celebrated brewer who and the co-owner of the acclaimed Russian River Brewing Company. He is known as a trailblazer in the area of craft beer, and he's often credited with pioneering the double India Pale Ale, the DIPA, DIPA. With a brewing career spanning over two decades, Vinny's innovative approach has resulted in numerous industry accolades and award. His dedication to quality and a deep understanding of brewing techniques have cemented his position as one of the most respected figures in the world of craft beer. And we have him today. So thank you, Vinny. I'm looking forward to all the rest of everything we're going to talk about. Thanks for the kind intro. That's uh, 
That's a, those are some words. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm going to let everybody always know. Always weird to hear that. Of... It's always weird to hear that stuff. <laughs> well, it's sure true. I'm going to jump on as a couple of things, others I want to cover right quick and we'll come right back to you. All right. So if you're a first time viewer, we do monthly free events with subject matter experts like Vinny. This is our 91st free major event. Thanks to monthly supporters via Patreon and individual webinar contributors. You may see that when you sign up. I want to thank you for that. And I'm incredibly appreciative because you enable these broadcasts to keep going forward. Gourmet Brewing is a community funded channel and supported by the generosity of so many of you through the crowdfunding site, Patreon. Um, supporters and get the audio files, behind the scenes, brewery tours. It's full of all kinds of full length interviews. I'm gonna try and put the link there in the chat. Sometimes it cooperates and sometimes it does not, but we will see. And if you get a minute, consider looking at that because it does help us keep going. I uh, also have a YouTube channel that I'm trying to build up. Uh, and I would love for you to join that, subscribe. Uh, and that really helps too. That is helping draw a lot of folks. It's a growing channel. We have some pretty neat stuff there. All right, if I can get this thing to work properly. Oh, now you've decided to freeze up. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay, well, we may have to move on. It looks like my computer has frozen. Hopefully not everything else. Ah, there we go. There we go. Sorry. Uh, click the follow button in the upper right hand corner and refreshing the browser solves most technical issues. Reducing the resolution in the bottom right gear symbol will also help if you're having internet problems. Please share in the chat where you're from. You've done that. If you've got LinkedIn or other connections, feel free to put those there in the chat. Now, your questions, don't put those in the chat. Uh, your questions ought to go in the ask a question field. And I know this is a brand new platform. So if you look on the right side of your screen, it's not where it used to be. There is a little square uh, box. It's the second one down. It says Q&A. So I know a lot of you have been there through 91 uh, previous streams, and it has moved. Uh, so click on that to post your questions, and Vinny, Vinny will uh, answer those in our second half. Uh, thanks for choosing auto registration. And if you're looking for speakers or virtual speakers or private virtual tastings and events, I also do those. And our next event, as I said already, is in July with Lars Marius Garshol and the Zoom after party. I'll put that link there in the chat, hopefully successfully. Again, I apologize. It's a new platform, so I'm trying to learn it. All right. So with all that, let's bring the main guy on the screen. Let's see if I can do it right this time, Vinny. Ha! With Got practice, I'm, I'm getting better. <laughs> Got it. So, Vinny, before we do a kickoff question, I have all these beautiful beers in front of me. I want everybody to see what 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 an envious refrigerator I have right now. Uh I want to open one of these guys. Which one do you think would be the most appropriate for I, us? I think, I think for your opening beer uh, from ours, because I know we're going to taste the goose in a little bit, I'd, I'd go with the Blind Pig. It's the mildest of the hops of those uh, beers from Russian River. The uh, the Happy right, Hops. The Happy, yeah, the happy Hops. hops the, the, well, no, I, I would go with Blind Pig. I was just going to say the Happy Hops is a little more over the top. So I, I would go with the Blind Pig IPA. It's kind of our classic, you know, classic West Coast IPA. It's often uh, our, you know, employees, co-workers, favorite beers here at the brewery. So I I'd, I'd definitely go with Blind Pig. Well, and I have to admit, in a recent tasting of Steve Mornigan and Whit, they're there in the audience. Uh, we all decided we'd like the Blind Pig the best too. <laughs> yeah, we hear that a lot. But somehow Pliny uh, outsells it by a lot. So, 
we wow. have we here here at the production brewery uh several of the uh you know we have 12 cct closed top fermenters and you know like 40 or 50 percent of them or more are always just filled with 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 pliny i think it's i think pliny's 65 70 percent of our production it's a pretty big big load of our production but blind blind pig yeah. is is a favorite too all right well we're going we're going to start with that guy uh if you don't mind if you don't mind describing that T- terrence says blind pig is the goat <laughs> <laughs> joshua says he agrees and steve morgan says yes blind pig so uh in our audience here it's certainly getting some high marks yeah yeah so the blind pig um compared to pliny is is a much lighter uh hop load um it also focuses on some old school hop varieties although it has amarillo in it it has a little bit of simcoe and a little bit of citra um it's still a good portion cascade centennial uh, and chinook and and it really does kind of harken back to the old days but as we'll get into in a little bit, you know, later on in um, in the video cast here, you know, that recipe has changed over time, and um, just as Pl- Pliny has as as well. Um, you know, we've when we're going to talk about crystal malt and specifically how it relates to IPA, um, and so same thing here. We've we've reduced it out, removed it, reduced it, and then removed it um, to really uh, showcase the hops more. And so you're still going to get a nice um, malt backbone to this beer, to Blind Pig. Um, and the hops themselves are definitely present. Uh, but at just six and a quarter percent alcohol, it's definitely lighter on the hops and the mouthfeel compared to, to Pliny. And, um, you know, it's, it's just over one pound per barrel dry hop. So, you know, in I know in some breweries, that's just like downright pedestrian. Um, and, and I can say that jokingly, um, that, you know, whatever it's at 1.1, 1.2 pound per barrel. Um, we have pale ales that are dry hopped at that level now, to be honest with you. Um, but you know, there's a time and place for a lighter alcohol, a little more easy drinking. Everything doesn't have to be just about more hops, more hops, more hops in an IPA. There really, um, there really can be a place to have a nice firm malt foundation. And there's definitely more malt showing in Blind Pig than there does uh, in Pliny the Elder. That's that's for sure. Look at the head on that guy. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that uh, is beautiful. Yeah. And it's and it's rocky. Yeah, it's like a, a float of dime on it. Firm. That's that. That's that old trick from the Germans. I think it. I think it was. Well, I, I know I was uh, talking to uh, Scott Jennings, and he was talking about his celebration ale, and he said he's trying to get it up to a quarter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and but that, also a little bit of bottle conditioning will help there too, give you a little better foam. This is not bottle conditioned. It's I, I never advocate to bottle condition. IPAs because the yeast in the bottle condition process will actually take up some of the hop aroma and, and flavor. So it's not something that we advocate for. Um, definitely in Belgian beers, not in IPAs. So, and, you know, th- there's an interesting uh, addition to that recipe recently was we were you know, even though I talk about that beer being a little bit on, you know, the softer side compared to Pliny, it's lower in alcohol. We were still, we were looking for a way recently to still lift the citrus notes out of the Centennial and the Cascade and, and the other qualities of some of the hops. And in the pilot brewery here, it's a little five barrel pilot brewery that I run. I started messing around with this kind of newer hop called Talus. And Talus has this beautiful pink grapefruit note if you use it in the right amount. And um, so we, I messed around with adding a little bit to a blind pig recipe or version of it. And I really liked what we saw. So we've actually recently, uh, maybe a couple of years ago now, a year ago, added just a tiny, tiny bit of talus to the dry hop. And it just has a way of lifting all the other hops in there. If you, if you add too much talus, it ends up having uh, this very almost coconut quality because it's, it's a 
it's the daughter to Sabro. Sabro is a newer hop variety that's very, very coconut and tropical in that sense. And it can be a little off putting as, as can Talus to a lot of people, but Talus has this beautiful pink grapefruit and we were trying to get more citrus. So we've, we've incorporated just a sliver of it into the hop, dry hop bill. So this, that brings me to my question. So what are some of the challenges and breakthroughs you experienced while creating the now iconic Pliny the Elder, but you also created Blind Pig too, I do believe, <laughs> a yeah. beer that has greatly influenced the craft beer world scene, not only in California, but around the world. I think you get people from all over the world when Pliny's ready yeah. to be shipped. So yeah. tell us about that. What were some of the challenges and breakthroughs? You, you know, Pliny the Elder was a bit of a slow burn, if you will. Um, you know, we started making it initially in uh, 2000 was uh, was the first time we, we made it. And um, before that, I was experimenting with a, a experimental hop called YCR 014, which ended up becoming Simcoe. And that became the cornerstone to the Pliny uh Plenty of the Elder recipe, Plenty of the Younger didn't come along until 2005. And, and so, you know, it was just a constant change over time. But I think what I'm most proud of is that, you know, Simcoe was really the first of the new private, you know, what I jokingly call designer hop varieties. And it, 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 it was a struggle for Yakima Chief to sell it initially and the three families that that own uh, the three family farms that own Simcoe, Peralt, uh, Loftus, which is the Smith family, and then the Carpenters, yeah, they they a couple of those farms came pretty close to going out of business, um, and Simcoe kind of saved them. But you know, Simcoe was first harvested uh, in 2000, and there was just nine acres of it. And again, previously it was under the experimental name YCR 014, and 2000 happens to be when we first brewed Pliny. Um, and by 2002, there was zero pounds of it harvested, and it it was it was it was just it, it just didn't take. At some point in there, I remember them telling me that they had to throw out 50,000 pounds. Um, but as it grew, and by like 2012, it, I think it was like one and a half million pounds that they had um, produced, and the the three families will talk about a parallel of basically the growth of Simcoe can parallel and can trace, can be traced to Pliny because we were using it and we were talking about it and other brewers were following us using it. And, and it's something that Natalie and I are really proud of because, you know, we've, we were able to help some family farms that at the time were really struggling. The hop industry is a lot stronger now, but uh, it wasn't back then. And, you know, to hear Mike Smith tell the story or Steve Peralt or Brad Carpenter tell, tell us, you know, how important Pliny was to their success of their farm in a really tough time um, is, is pretty humbling. Wow. I had no idea. <laughs> well, I, I think that's clearly one of the things you were getting. That is a unique story. I have, I yeah. have not heard that. That sounds like one that needs to be captured. <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's been talked about, but it's not something that you know. I don't know that's ever been written or wherever, whatever. But it it is something that we are very proud of, and and it's like I said, it's just a very humbling uh, thing to know that you know you've helped some family farms, which you know, as we all know, they're kind of the cornerstone of the U.S. agriculture, and um, and it's tough. Farming's tough, whether it's you know, whatever it is, hops or anything else. Well, Vinny, I promised everybody we would talk about dry hopping. And I've got a question for you, because, I mean, it, it, it seems like you can't put enough hops. Now, you may not be able to afford to put all the hops <laughs> in a beer that you want, but it seems like we're, you know, in a hop race. And But there's some weird things that seem to be going on that if you keep increasing dry hops, there seems to be a change in the bitterness that that I don't understand, and I'll bet you do. Can you enlighten us on that? 
Yeah, yeah, it's pretty um, counterintuitive, but um, and I, I can't remember who did the initial work on this. If it was one of the hop purveyors, or if it was um, Tom Shellhammer up at Oregon State. But basically, the more you dry hop, the uh, less bitter it becomes via isomerized alpha acids. So the alpha acids or the bitterness that's contributed through the hops you add in the kettle on the hot side, those will actually reduce over uh, an, in, in an heavily dry hopped beer because essentially you have those isomerized alpha acids in the beer in your tank and they're, for lack of better words, being reabsorbed into the green matter of the dry hops and then those dry hops fall to the bottom of the tank, you dump the cone, and basically you've you've discharged um, that. And and I don't know where the exact point is, um, you know, specifically because it's another part that needs to be brought up here is just how um, insignificant the IBU rating is now, uh, you know, this day and age with uh with ipas and that that really leans into um this compound called a humulinone and humulinones are um for like most basic simple way to describe them is they're oxidized alpha acids and but but one unit of humulinone isn't the same as one bu of um isomerized alpha acid a, a humulinone is only 0.66 as bitter. So basically 0.66 BU value of humulinone is one BU of isomerized alpha acid. And so when you run the traditional IBU measurement on the spectrophotometer, which is what, if a, if a brewery has a lab and they are measuring BUs, they're most likely doing it on a spectrophotometer. There is this thing uh, called an HPLC that, you know, a, a larger um, quality focus brewery would have that, such as like Sierra Nevada, I'm sure has an HPLC and, and others at their size or bigger. Um, and certainly, you know, hop purveyors would. Um, and there you can measure BUs and break everything apart. You can break out what uh, bitterness was contributed from isomerized alpha acids from just the few regular alpha acids that do actually make it into the final beer, the humulinones and those. And so you can take a measurement and get a, a feeling for really where you're at. But when you run a BU test an international bittering unit test on a spectrophotometer, uh, like I said, that's what most small breweries have. It doesn't know the difference between a humulinone and and I summarized alpha acid. So it's just taken a total measurement and it gets a little bit mixed up. And so, so the, the IBU measurement is a little obsolete in finished beer. It's not, it's not a bad thing to, um, to use if you're just trying to track, say your bitterness on the hot side with your wart. And we'll, we'll still do those tests on occasion just to make sure that our wart BU is tracking somewhere in the right neighborhood. Um, so for Pliny, I think we're at like 110 to 120, and then you lose a lot in fermentation by yeast, by way of yeast or, or what have you. And, and so now you've got this beer that is lost some bitterness from the, you know, let's say a heavily hot beer like Pliny that's lost some beer uh, from the uh, hot side that are isomerized alpha acids, but when you dry hop with a big load, those dry hops are contributing these humulinones. So you're gaining uh, bitterness back, but it's at a 0.66 uh, percentage compared to one isomerized alpha, BUs of isomerized alpha acid. So hopefully that makes sense. But it, in short, it just kind of mixes things up, makes it a big, you know, mixed bowl of fruit. And it's tough to really find the true exact number. And so that's why a lot of small breweries don't even measure IBUs anymore in their finished beer. We don't. We 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 might do it on occasion just for fun, but because um, it's just not accurate. And 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 for us, it's a great comparison to uh, we have our regular Pliny the Elder, and then we make a special one-off version that we can three four times a year called DDH, so double dry hop. 
Pliny the Elder. And there, we've instead of using the two pound per barrel in regular Pliny in the DDH that you just held up, that's four pound per barrel. And it's a great comparison because when you taste them side by side, the DDH is actually less bitter. Well, speaking of that, that's next, right? That is, <laughs> whenever you're ready. Well, the other thing is I promised to uh, show that video before we leave or right before we get into Pliny uh, of uh, your open top fermenter. Is this a yeah. good time to do yeah. that? Yeah, why, why don't you do that? I can talk you through it, and then uh, we can get into the beers. All right. The Pliny's, so that is. Get all my buttons right. Yeah. Let's see. One more here. And I think we're ready. Hi, here we are in our OTF room. This is the first two batches of Pliny the Younger for 2023 for our wholesale distribution. Uh, we love making this beer in our open top fermenters. We feel that it really adds the complexity and the softness to the beer. The recipe for Pliny the Younger this year is pretty much the same as last, with the addition of a new hop called Nectar on, which is a beautiful New Zealand hop that we used earlier in the year on the R&D group. Can't wait to have a young girl involved in Cheers. Yeah, so that was that was there in our OTF room, and that was the first run of Pliny the Younger in 2023. That was for the wholesale distribution. Then we brew it again for our in-person release here. And um, yeah, open top fermentation is often thought of as a you know German Weizen wheat beer uh, tank. Um, there are lots of breweries in Germany using it for Hellas and Pilsner. My favorite is, is Schoen Rahm, uh, our friend Eric Toft, American, who brews there. Um, absolutely stunning, beautiful beers. Um, and, and you see, you know, old school British and Belgian. And of course, you have cool ships, but that's a little bit different. Um, and, and so we use open tops for all of our lagers, for a lot of our Belgian uh, inspired beers. But we use it as much as we can for our hoppy beers. And in that case, Plenty of the Younger, we find that the one-to-one -one ratio, it's as wide as it is tall, and we can blow off a lot of those fusel alcohols and get a much cleaner uh, beer. And we end up with a, uh, a beer that on the back end is 10 and a quarter percent alcohol, has almost no alcohol uh, flavor to it. And we really think the open tops have a lot to do with that. So we're, we're super excited to be able to offer that and to show people what open tops are like. And we're not the only brewery in America with them. Um, that type that we had in that video, that's uh, Sierra Nevada and Mills River have those identical tanks. And New Glarus has similar open tops in at their brewery as well. Well, I'm ready to give this Pliny a pour. Would you... Uh... Do me a favor and describe what uh, we, we're enjoying here for everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we it is limited distribution. We sell 80% of our beer here in California. Um, I, I saw Drew on the, the chat there on the side. I, I know he can get it and uh, probably has some, so hopefully. But yeah, Pliny is definitely a, uh, it's a hop forward beer. I talked about it being two pounds, a little over two pound per barrel dry hop. Uh, it's it's definitely got a light yellow uh, copper uh, color. Um, the aroma is going to be pine, citrus type, and citrus when I'm I'm thinking grapefruit specifically. Uh, there might be some lychee uh, fruit in there a little bit. Um, there might be just a small amount of onion garlic, uh, a little bit of dankness, but but only a, a, a small amount. If there's a lot, then we haven't done our job right, but that's a hard thing to control when you're dry hopping it over two pound per barrel. Um, flavor is going to be very similar, uh, and it has a striking bitterness to it. I've always loved bitterness, and for several years now, and and a lot through a lot of the you know growth of hazy IPA, there's been a bit of an assault on bitterness in the beer industry, and and I'm and I'm I'm fine with someone not you know making a beer that's bitter that's you know like an ipa but for me personally i think it's the bitterness is what draws you back and wants you to keep uh you know drinking more it's that thirst quenching component of an ipa or a pilsner for that matter like you know to me a well named a well-made pilsner is going to have a really clean crisp dry bitter finish and that just wants brings you back to to drink more and so for 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 pliny being a double ipa 
um, that bitterness is an important component and it's something that we've never shied away from. We use a bittering hop called Warrior that's a uh, really clean bitterness and it's something that I've always uh, liked since the day it came out and, um, and something we still use to this day. Well, you know, I'm impressed with how bright it is. I'll be honest, that was unexpected. And there's there's also a stone fruit component that comes from Amarillo. Amarillo is the kind of second hop. If I had to go down the hop bill and say, okay, there's Simcoe's the number one used hop, and then uh, Amarillo would be number two. We're looking for a very specific Simcoe variety or a Simcoe uh, flavor and aroma as well as Amarillo. For Simcoe, let's just call the picking window 10 days. Uh, we want to be typically between four and five days. And Simcoe was the first hop variety for me that taught me that picking window matters. So in that 10-day picking window, and it might be a little bit longer now, but let's just call it 10 days because what it should be. Early Simcoe will give you uh, a lot of grapefruit, really light, crisp grapefruit. Middle harvest window pint Simcoe. So early harvest window is uh, the grapefruit, middle harvest window is uh, pine and then late harvest window is going to be more like dank and cannabis and more onion garlic and then if you go like early middle it's going to have some grapefruit and some pine and that's that's right where natalie and i want to be with the um the simcoe that we pick with amarillo we want lots of stone fruit peach apricot um, and Amarillo is grown in so many places that the picking window is, is just massive. It's you know, at one point it was like a 30 day picking window and that's really hard to control. So we, we go with some very specific farms for our Amarillo to ensure that we can have a tighter picking window to pick from. And then we can get that old school Amarillo that I remember using in the early 2000s that has big peach apricot stone fruit notes. I can't stand it any longer. <laughs> Mm. And the I have the same bottling that you have, mm. which was um, wow. just th three days ago. So I, I shipped you that on Monday. I think you got it Tuesday or Wednesday. I we pulled it literally pulled it right off the the bottling line when uh, when when we shipped it to you. So but freshness matters. That's you yeah. know nobody no nobody should buy an IPA off the shelf, and I don't care whose it is if it's a mega brewery or a tiny small brewery no one should buy an ipa off the shelf if it's not kept cold and um that's i know that doesn't work with mainstream distribution in a lot of places but um you know check the check the bottling or canning date um and and if there isn't one i wouldn't buy it either we have natalie and i have very strict rules about that too yeah i thought looks like that head's holding up nicely and uh I think there's a little something going on in the bottom of that glass. Yep, there is some nucleation as well on the bottom. So it's a little little trick uh, that uh, that we do with our with, with some of our glassware, and uh, we love to have that etch down there, and it just helps keep the foam. But um, you know, our, our brewing team works really hard though, because you know you drink with your nose and you drink with your eyes as well, and um, you know, hazy IPA turned that on its head. Uh, which is great because Hazy IPA brought a ton of new, fresh ideas to really make your beers even more hoppy and like umptuous hoppy, if you will. Um, I, I kind of feel like that's how we've always made Pliny. We've always had like big, big whirlpool additions. And although, you know, we have done hop additions throughout the, um, the, the brewing kettle hot side, you know, we've and we've adjusted those as well we've always made really big um you know whirlpool additions to get not only a big hop aroma from dry hop but the flavor as well well what i was doing here and i thought you might be able to explain it a little bit so it's not that blind pigs that much better uh but they're you know the differences between them. Can you can you share that? I thought Pliny was brighter than the blind pig, but I'm not sure it is now. Looking at them, and the color is almost yeah. identical. Yeah, they're both so, they're both run through a centrifuge only, um, and so 
there's no filter after the centrifuge um, and and we're then we're capturing some co2 in the fermenter but we're giving it the rest of its carbonation coming out of the centrifuge in line and the both recipes now are for blind pig and Pliny the elder and for that matter the ddh it's just silo malt our two row uh, that we get from rar uh, malting and then uh, Pliny gets a little bit of sugar to give it just some really simple sugars for fermentables and then um, and, and that's that's really it. And there's also a little bit of best pale in the uh, blind pig, which is an English uh, malt from Simpson malt. And that's just to add a little bit of body and mouthfeel to it because it is lower in alcohol. Uh, a lot of you know, a lot of times when you think of like the big the full flavored English malt, you're going to think of like Maris Otter or um, uh, like Golden Promise and there you're getting these big nutty notes and when i discovered best pale gosh well over a decade ago it was all that fullness from that you get from say like maris otter but it didn't have all the the rich nutty malty notes and, and nothing against those they're great english beers but when using them in an american ipa like blind pig i was just looking for something to lift the body and i and we were looking for ways to not use like carapils or use more carapils because it's something that we used to use in that recipe, which is a dextrin unfermentable malt. And, um, and so that's going to contribute a tiny bit of color to the more color to the blind pig than the Pliny, but the flip side, the Pliny is a higher alcohol beer. So it's getting more base malt, more silo malt. And so it's gaining more color there also. So they probably kind of balance out in the middle. Well, as you can tell, I am shifting around. <laughs> some bottles, uh, and what I thought I would do is pour the uh, double dry hopped. Yeah, go for it. And I can talk about that if you want, and I'll yes. give, it a, give it a taste here. All right, let me make sure it's good and focused so everybody can see. So a little little story about DDH Pliny. Um, that actually started out, and any, anyone that's on the uh, video cast today that maybe bought uh, our beer during the pandemic, they remember, and they, they probably know the story. Um, we, they maybe bought the beer that we had called Pliny for president. And so we, for years have had this fun little exercise every four years that we made t-shirts and hats or whatever that Pliny was running for president. And of course his running mate was blind pig. Um, and so in 2020, which was the middle of the pandemic, Natalie says to me, you know, we should, we should like bottle some Pliny under the Pliny for president. Um, you know, moniker and create a label. And I said, well, we're going to do that. Let's uh, create a whole new recipe. So it wasn't that far off from regular Pliny, but in short, it was double dry hopped. And after uh, it was a pretty smashing success. And after the uh, election was over, um, you know, we said, oh, okay, we're not going to make it for four years until 24. Well, we got so much pushback from our customers that we rebranded it, DDH, double dry hop. Pliny the Elder, or specifically, as it says, two-stage double dry hop Pliny the Elder. And uh, so for 2024, we will create a new Pliny for President recipe. It won't just be this one rehashed. I've, I'm starting to work on some stuff in the pilot brewery that I already have already. Um, and my specifically, I said two-stage double dry hop is that double dry hop is, if, in, in, to some degree, it's a marketing term and it does help sell beer. But I really wanted to, to let our customers know that not only did we double the amount of dry hops, but we added it over two stages. And we've monkeyed around with doing regular Pliny dry hops, one stage, two stage. Right now we're, at, we're, we're doing it at one stage. Um, and so we truly make it, we make a two pound per barrel dry hop edition. And then a few days later, we make a second two pound per barrel dry hop edition. And thus the, the double, the two stage double dry hop. But when you, it's gonna have a little bit more of a, uh, of a the peach apricot stone fruit aroma at least that's what i get um it's also to me tastes less bitter um it's not remarkably less bitter it's not a huge amount but it's it's definitely there and uh, and to me again it all goes back to that conversation that you're losing a little bit of bu's when you're um when you're doing uh, a heavy dry hop due to the dry hops absorbing some of the isomerized alpha acids. And it should also be noted that even though we're gaining some 
uh, bitterness from the humulinones, the oxidized alpha acids, that's a softer bitterness. And, and so it tends to not be as hard on the palate. So to me, it, I used to call it perceived bitterness. This is like 25 years ago. I had no idea what, what was going on. Um, now I understand through academia what humulinones are and how they work and what they contribute. And so there's this, there's this index of your hops called HSI, the hop storage index that the hop industry came up with decades ago. So in short, the higher the HSI, basically the poorer your hops are being stored or potential of being stored, um, the more oxidation you're having in your hops. And because humulinones are oxidized alpha acids, a higher HSI is going to mean that you're going to potentially have more humulinones. And, and they're hard to control. So it really drives the point that hop storage at a brewery uh, or hop purveyor is really important. And that the colder you store them, the more consistently you can keep uh, everything in the hops being fresh. But it, in the back end, you're going to end up with um, probably less inconsistency from the humulinone standpoint in an IPA. So as we compare these, uh, I'll bring it up full screen. You want to kind of contrast the two? Now we've lost the head yeah. pretty quick in the yeah, double different dry. glass too. Yep, and yeah. um, and the the um, the color should be almost the same. And it's you know those are different glasses, so hard to say exactly. But it it is the same uh, base malt bill. Now when we come back with our uh, twenty. 24 planning for president, that's going to end up being a, a different alcohol beer. I'm going to do something a little bit different, change it up the hot bill. It'll still have a through line of, of, of a Simcoe through it. That's for sure. Um, but, um, but from a flavor standpoint, like I said, the, uh, the regular plane is actually just a little bit more bitter. And, and we, we see these emails from customers all the time because, you know, they, they love to do the Pepsi challenge of regular Pliny and DDH Pliny and, do that side by side comparison, especially if you can get, you know, cans and bottles that are within a couple of weeks of each other. You can really tell uh, uh, and see the difference there. And and I just I just think it's the coolest thing that adding more ends up almost giving you a little bit less, even though you're adding these humulones back, which are in fact bitter, but they're a little cleaner bitterness. Well, I am ready to do this Pepsi challenge. Yeah, and and something I'll ta I'll mention when you're tasting, maybe do your initial taste, is that they are pretty light, and there there's there's definitely not a lot of color to them. As I mentioned, we're now just using our base two row silo malt that we get from Rar Malting, and then Pliny gets a little sugar and. Um, they, well, they both get a little sugar. It's the same malt bill for the beer because they're both 8% alcohol too. But I'm curious of your thoughts. What What is the ABV? What do you think it is? <laughs> I don't know, but that double dry hop, that could sneak up on you. <laughs> they're both they're both 8% alcohol. And uh, I, remember, I remember one year for Pliny the Younger, our good friend, John Mallett, who uh, used to run Bells, is now uh, retired from Bells, uh, happened to be in the area for playing the Younger. And we were sitting at the pub drinking some Youngers, and he looked at me and goes, what's, what's he? And we always did a trade of Hop Slam for Younger, because they always came out about the same time of year. So it was always really fun. And he's like, what's the alcohol? I got 10 and a quarter. He's like, yep, oh, you win the award for hide the alcohol. So I... <laughs> I, I wear that with a badge of honor that yeah, and, and with regular elder too. And that has a lot to do with how we mash the grains, the use of sugar to make it dry, very drinkable, almost take a Pilsner approach to it in dryness. Um, now, granted, there's a lot of breweries that make much drier beer. Now we, for, for those are, that are, are listening or watching that are, you know, brewers, we're finishing at about two and a half Play-Doh. And that to me is a sweet spot. If it's any drier than that, if we get closer to two Play-Doh, then the beer becomes just a little too thin. And also it shows the bitterness a little too much. 
but more importantly, it shows the alcohol more typically. Um, if it's any higher than two and a half Play-Doh, 2.6 is 2.5 to 2.6 Play-Doh is like my range. If it's any higher than say 2.6, then we're getting a little bit too sweet and cloying. And it, it blows me away to hear some hazy IPA brewers talk about their beers finishing at like four Play-Doh, four and a half Play-Doh. Um, it's no knock against them that, you know, it just, it's not something that I could do even with our hazy IPA that we make on occasion. But, um, but I, but I love the aroma of DDH. I mean, regular Pliny is great, but DDH just takes it over the top. Yeah. I'm going to try and arrange these. I'm, I'm kind of running out of space here, but that's a good problem to have. <laughs> uh, so the one in the center is blind pig. This yeah. one, that's probably not working too well there. Let me, yeah, that looks good. Re rearrange these a little bit. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll do this. Probably not the best order. All right. So maybe that works a little better. So, yeah. but, but you can see the color. They're all the same. Imagine, imagine being a bartender or, or particularly a server. So the bartender takes or a server takes an order from a, a table and, you know, let's just say it's a blind pig, a regular Pliny and a DDH, because we actually have all three of those on right now. And if you were to pour Happy Hops, that other bottle I sent you, it's the same color. Um, and then the server comes to the server station and has to figure out which one is what. So we have a, a specific protocol on how you do these things and, you know, being in alphabetical order, basically, because everything looks the same. And that's you know, the, for small breweries, and, and we're 40,000 barrels, we're not a small brewery anymore, but we, Natalie and I still think that way, and we still run our brewery as a small brewery, and that's why we have a little five-barrel pilot brewery to be innovative and create new brands and come up with new processes, and maybe we learn from some of the young bucks and the kids in the industry these days, as we jokingly say, but like, you know, that's something where we've we've continue to move and you know in the direction of making our hoppy beers lighter and lighter to make the malt bill lighter to let the hops come through and kind of blast through more and that was a lot to do with removing crystal malt from the recipes seems like there's a little more body in pliny yeah but I may have to take back my blind pig being my favorite. That double is pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and and I'll and I'll add that I did take the time to look at the uh, finishing uh, numbers on both the DDH and the uh, the regular Pliny, and they were within like a tenth of a Play-Doh, which is pretty tough to taste in a beer that this is that that is this hoppy. So you're, you're pretty much right at 8% alcohol on both of those. And, and also, you know, so one thing with the TTB, you have a 0.3% window of alcohol. So the Pliny could technically be as low as 7.7 .7 and as high as 8.3. Um, if, if in a, in a perfect world, we will always be at eight, but if it's going to shift one way or the other, I'd rather it be lower than higher because when it gets up to like 8.2 and we've had times where it was 8.2 8.3 the alcohol just shows through it's too hot there's too much heat and you do start tasting that heat more uh in in pliny and so it's really important to nail the eight percent not just from the legal standpoint but also like that's what the consumer is expecting and it's what we expect of ourselves for consistency well I think one of the things that you brought up, and I apologize for being off screen. If I can, oops, I hit the wrong one. There, oops. Well, that works too. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. That's probably where I should be. <laughs> I feel like I'm your guinea pig. <laughs> well, you truly are. Although I'm that's not sure no I'm going to use this platform again. Uh, crystal malt came up. Benny, and you've mentioned it in the discussion. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit. Uh, yeah. I was, you challenged me to go find a widely distributed IPA without any crystal malt. Uh, I actually contacted Mr. Mallet and I contacted Charlie Bamsforth. And I went down a long list of yeah. them 
And Mitch Steele was the one who came through and he said, Doc, go get a Goose Island IPA. It does not have any, it's widely distributed. Well, darn it. I looked on their website and they, the website said C60, but I talked to the brewer, Daryl, just an hour or two ago. He said, it's actually C60 and not C20. Yeah. Um, so what, what is it about crystal malt? You avoid it. It sounds like at all costs, although you used to use it. I thought I heard earlier. Why do you believe that crystal hurts the drinking pleasure or the drinking experience? Um, so how, how did you make this decision and how does it impact the final beer? Yeah. So, uh, first off I'll say, yeah, we definitely did once use crystal malt in, um, Pliny. Let's just use Pliny for example, cause we make so much of it, but I took the time earlier and I, have this binder that has some old brew logs in it. And I found the very first Pliny brew log. And I'm just looking at my notes here. And that was in uh, uh, 2000 was the first time we made Pliny. And it had 3.85% crystal malt in it. And um, that was a mix of crystal 40 and 15. Um, so not a huge amount still. And that was always the cornerstone of West Coast IPA is that it was you know, had a little bit of crystal malt, but it wasn't like an English IPA that had a much larger amount that had a much deeper color. Um, and then I scrolled through some old brew logs in 2015, we were down to 1.3% and that was crystal uh, 40. And um, in 2018, we're at, and that's about when we opened our Windsor, California production brewery, we were at 0.6%. So you can see that we were whittling it down. And then a couple of years ago, um, we started removing it completely. And for that transition, we went with Munich 30 and some Crystal 40, and then slowly transitioned to all Munich 30, and then eventually transitioned out of that. Um, because honestly, at that point, we didn't see a difference in Munich wasn't contributing that much more malt fullness. And we could gain that back from a higher mash temperature, trying to hit two and a half Play-Doh. And granted, through all this, we were dialing in our German brew house, which takes a while. So anyway, so we are now, so you can just kind of see the, the, the path that we took. And when you make uh, crystal malts, um, you know, as a roasting process, and yes, some uh, caramel malts is always a distinction that I will say are kiln, but crystal malts are roasted. You've got the melanoidin um, process happening, where which is basically like it's browning of um, of the grain. That's like some polymers are formed, and in the in the mallard reaction, you've got the color formation, aroma, flavor, and this happens with coffee, chocolate. It's it's all over the food industry. Um, and, and there's an, it's, it's a little, there's no hard science on this topic per se. I was, I was actually looking for some papers on it, um, before, uh, the, the video cast here the other day. And, um, but you see more like anecdotal information that crystal caramel malts will cause oxidation. Um, and, and it's, 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 it's really just an accelerated oxidative process that it's probably more than anything it's just chipping away at the hop character and that really fresh crispness of of a of an ipa and and it might just be that it's the the actual like there's something else oxidizing that's causing that i you know it's it's a little bit beyond my uh my pay grade but those those caramel and toffee flavors of those kind of mid-range crystal malts you know, that they're oxidizing themselves and then they just take on a fuller, more deep fruit. I don't know, maybe, I don't know, raisin. I, I'm not sure what, what else to say or current or something like that. Um, but it, it, at the end of the day, you're still seeing lots of larger craft breweries adding crystal malt to their IPA. Um, but you're, there's not a lot of smaller breweries, a lot of small, unless they're like classically making a, an old school West coast IPA. Um, they're, they've really pulled back all of my brewer friends 
at least here on the West Coast, have have pulled back from crystal malts on their uber hoppy beers. Um, and and it's and it could just be that like in, in doing some of this research to really drill down into it to try to find some actual written um, you know text on this is just could be like those melanoidins themselves are what are oxidizing, and and then through fermentation or there was some stuff that talked about you know like before fermentation that there's some oxidation going on and then through yeah. You know, fermentation and it can get really deep and scientific that you know you've got this issue and then somehow you're you're creating aldehydes and if you research aldehydes and and um oxidation you've got you know if 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 you if you're going to be forming some aldehydes during the malting process or the roasting process then potentially those are compounds that are um oxidized and and aldehydes are an oxidative compound, um, or at least they're partly an oxidative compound in beer. So it's, it's a little scientific and, and very wonky. Um, but at the same time, like there's so much, there's so many small breweries that just have gone away from crystal malt. And, and you and I were talking about it before when we were, you know, just making sure our connection was right, was that the, Big, bigger breweries, whether they're big craft breweries or industrial breweries, they're not the first ones to to make a change. You know, think of Hazy IPA is a perfect example. You know, the big craft breweries didn't jump on. Sierra Nevada and New Belgium didn't jump on and make a hazy beer right away. They waited, watched the trends, and and they eventually came on and and both make really great hazy IPAs. Um, and and so I think this is maybe one of those cases too where you've got small breweries leading the way, just like home brewers lead the way to come up with creative and innovative recipes and techniques and whatnot. And, and maybe that's the same thing here. Um, but, you know, even at 40,000 barrels, as I said earlier, we kind of think of ourselves as a small brewery. And, and maybe it's also what's kept Pliny relevant is that we've always changed. We've continued to tweak the recipe. And, and so it's something that we followed the science and, and we followed what our polio factor, our sensory, you know, we were, we just did sensory training earlier with our, with our team. And, and for that, we were doing off flavor and oxidation is, is one of those, those flavors. And, uh, and that's something you get when you have an IPA that is got crystal malt, then it might not be the crystal malt either. That's maybe triggering the oxidation or all the oxidation. There's, there could, I mean, I've speculated that the heavy uh, hop load that we add, that maybe the hops, because of like fertilizers, they have a little more heavy metals. We're adding more uh, hops to our beers, and maybe that's triggering oxidation. But what we know for sure is from your malt, you have what's called fan, free amino nitrogen. And fan has one use and one use only, and that's as a, um, yeast nutrient and so any excess fan in your beer ends up in time um, becoming an oxidative property strucker degradation and and if you're have all this excess fan in your beer you're going to end up with a beer that oxidizes faster well if you're making a big ipa you're going to add more malt and that means that you're adding more fan your yeast is only going to use so much and then you're going to have more fan than say a light golden ale or a you know, light lager or something, those big breweries are adding 30, 40% um, adjuncts and they're diluting that high fan level down. So the, the, the malt that we use, at least in North America, is too high for craft beer. And so if there's a way to reduce that. That would also help um, reduce oxidation in your beer. Well, I tell you what, I, I promised everybody we would pour uh, the Goose Island IPA. But while I'm pouring it, I know we normally talk about it, but what I'd love to hear you talk about, we're right at the top of the hour, so I want to switch to the questions pretty quick. But uh, I had the opportunity to spend about two and a half hours with Ken Grossman uh, back in the fall, and he was walking me through his approach for all of his beers, but in particular celebration. And he really emphasized in celebration, at least, 
the importance of crystal malt in that yep, particular beer. Yeah. Uh, but I also went to find out as I asked the brewers because I thought surely Sierra Nevada has a beer without crystal malt. Uh, I think there's only one in general, and it's the hazy. So yep. Ken feels very strongly, at least in his all his years, that and, and we were specifically talking about celebration ale, but it spills over in the others. Uh, clearly, he thinks it's an important thing. So, what, what, how would you contrast that against your belief that maybe not? Yeah, yeah, no, and you know, Ken, Ken is a huge uh, mentor, he's a big old friend, longtime friend, one of my best friends actually, and mentor. And um, you know, they're just it's just varying philosophies of of brewing, and I think it really goes to the fact that there is no right or wrong way of making a beer um using crystal malt in in an ipa or a hoppy beer is definitely an old school um technique but i i think ken would also tell you that he doesn't want you drinking it at you know six months old um because it's it's going to be a shell of a beer of what it was originally and um and and you can't a beer like that that has always been so iconically red in color like there's no way to to really get that and keep the same flavor. Um, I think what's important there is like, just drink it fresh. Um, you know, I remember uh, before Charlie Bamforth retired from UC Davis and I would go speak at his class at Davis every year. And we would always go out to dinner and have a, a nice meal and chit chat. And, you know, I asked him, uh, what's the best thing I can do as a brewer? And this is before we had our new modern dream brewery. What's the best thing we can do to, keep our beers fresh. And he said, just keep them cold. Like, and, and that's, that's a little oversimplification because you know, you want to make sure you have a little packaging uh, oxygen, which is something that Ken and I have talked about for hours. And we actually went down the rabbit hole of buying uh, a small can line. He needed it for his pilot brewery. We needed it just to run normal day-to-day -day cans but we went down that road together and had the exact same line and we tested together and shared all the information but anyways all things being equal and you have low do like the best thing you can do i remember charlie telling me is like just keep your beer cold and you know and and that that is oversimplifying it but going back to your question um you know that's just something that they believe in and and that that's a part of their their uh the recipes and you know torpedo has crystal malt obviously sierra nevada pale ale does um they're 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 going a lot deeper than any brewery is i mean they've they've got this piece of equipment called the icp instrument that can basically measure like metal ions and you know measure the iron content and finding where exactly the oxidation is coming from and then honing in on it and they've got much greater uh lab instrumentation than the average brewery and we have a pretty nice lab but it pales in comparison to what ken has and i and i will also add that we always have sierra nevada pale ale in our fridge at home it's still one of my favorite beers well as we wrap up i thought what i would do is kind of show all these lined up we look at the color differences uh, and then, then we'll switch to the questions if that's okay. Absolutely. All right. So I will make sure these are clear. So we have Pliny. Move this mic. Pliny over here. We have the double dry hopped Pliny. We have the blind pig here. And this is the uh, Goose Island yeah. IPA. Which is just a little slight bit darker. You can, mm -hmm. I, at least I can see that from the uh, malts, the extra specialty malts that they use. Um, and and theirs is definitely a little brighter. The goose is. Um, I I uh, randomly I went to my local supermarket, which has a huge beer selection, and they didn't have or they were out of Goose Island, so I was not able to to grab one. But um, I'll I'll trust your taste there on your end, Doug. Well, I hadn't tried it yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't mean to take over the whole screen. I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying yeah. to. <laughs> okay. 
I ain't tried it yet. And it's, it's quite a bit lighter than what we've been trying. So it's yeah. a little bit of an unfair comparison, but yeah. very drinkable. It's a bit sweeter. Yeah. Which which could be that C60 in there. Mine, I'm guessing, since it has an expiration date of August 20th, I'm guessing it's roughly three months old, two months old, maybe, uh, depending on kind of, I'm not sure what they allow. Yeah. I would guess it'd be four months, three months tops, three and a half, something like that. I know uh, it is, what, 150 days at Sierra Nevada. And you might not even let yours go that long. No, we go with a bottled on date and then uh, let the consumer decide, uh, you know, if it's where they want it to be, as opposed to saying best buy, you know, like a gallon of milk. Um, there, there's no right or wrong way of, of doing that. Um, it's And we have a salesperson and that works for Russian River in virtually every market that sells our beer. So we're out there combing the market and um, and our consumers, our our customers reach out and tell us. And, you know, they'll sometimes email us and say, you know what, I, I bought a bottle and it was a yeah, it was three months old or whatever, just didn't taste right. And they'll email, tell us, and we're happy to replace the bottle. And, you know, we we are uh focused on as the best flavor and aroma quality as possible. And when you're making IPAs that are, you know, big over the top dry hop beers like we do, and, and honestly not even close to what some of the smaller breweries are doing now, but you know, we know we have really low oxygen levels, total package oxygen. And that's something we're fanatical about. I always say it's kind of our religion, but, um, but we're always looking to uh, make sure that our accounts are selling the beer at the freshest, they're keeping it cold, they're selling it cold. And also we're managing their par, you know, how much beer they get each week, whether it's distributed directly from us or from one of our distributors and make sure that they don't have too much of it sitting in back so that the customer is always grabbing it, you know, hopefully when it's two, three weeks old, maybe four weeks tops. But I, I, I say drink it within eight weeks if keeping it cold. 12 weeks max, don't go, go, don't go past 12 even kept cold. And and because you'll lose too much of the nice fresh hop, you know, note to it. And you know, if you you wouldn't buy a, a you know jug of milk that was past its date or sitting out warm. So why do your why 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 buy your IPA that way? <laughs> well, I know that's especially true of Celebration Ale, which is a fabulous beer when it's a few weeks old but it seems to diminish and it could be that crystal ball. I don't know. And it's, uh, you know, it's I all beers, what, all beers uh, oxidized, you know, that's just, that's just what happens. And Joshua and so, Walton calls it the enjoy by date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. Well, Vinny, uh, this has been awesome. As we kind of wrap up and transition to the questions, uh, looks like I think I could see about six questions so far. We'll switch to those. I bet there'll be more. And just to let everybody know, there's a hard stop uh, in about 50 minutes. And then we'll transition to the Zoom. And if you can hang on for that, that would be great. Do you need a yeah. break or anything? Need to get another good. beer? No, we're all, all right. good. All right. So as we wrap up, we're here talking about double dry hopping. And there's Hop Creek. There's the Humulones change and the IBUs change. We're talking about Crystal Mall. We covered a lot of topics. But if you were to bring it all together and, and you were speaking at a conference and you were telling brewers, hey, bottom line, these are the three most important things or two, whatever the number is, about dry hopping beers, what what would that be? Would you? I know I'm catching you cold on that. Yeah, no. Yeast health is oddly the first one because it's it is a one of the biggest contributors to uh, hop creep is poor yeast health, and if you have good yeast health, so making good zinc additions for yeast nutrient, that's that's definitely going to uh, be one. Um, watch your pH. Um, pH is definitely something that 
you know, I, I just pulled up the Q and A and I see that, you know, someone asked about, um, pH rise. And, and so you got to watch your, your pH because that's going to help. Uh, you're going to have hop creep no matter what, if you, you know, when you're dry hopping in significant quantities, but dry hopping does increase pH. And, and so you got to control your, um, your, your pH and, and make sure that that's not too high because otherwise you'll never clear the diacetyl on basically what's a secondary diacetyl rest after, after hop creep. And, um, you know, and then I'll, and I'll just say it's a pretty stereotypical answer, but I'm going to use it. Um, is the freshness and the quality of your ingredients really matter? You know, we've, it's something that can always made a cornerstone of Sierra Nevada. And, uh, and it's something that I think all great brewers put a focus on, whether it's malt, hops, you know, yeast, the, you know, the viability, cell counter of yeast, whatever it is. Um, those, those are, those are the three things that I would, I would focus on because you can't, you can't take poor hops and make a well made dry hop beer. Um, that it's just, it's just not going to translate because those, those hops, if they have an off aroma to them or flavor to them, you just, you just can't cover it up. Well, and I wanted to switch over, Vinny. Look, this is the uh, Blind Pig, which we opened almost an hour ago. And look at the head and look at the lacing. Uh, that's pretty impressive. That's been sitting out room temperature for an hour. Uh, by the way, it won't go to waste. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so. No, it will not go to waste. But I, that's pretty impressive. Beautiful beer. Uh, and Joshua, I hope you'll put your question on the quad IPA in the list, because I would love to know if Vinny's going to work on a quad IPA. So don't answer now, Vinny. See nope. if he puts it in the questions. Yeah, and we'll yeah. come there. So and we're past the top of the hour. Thank you for those that only allowed an hour. Uh, we're going to transition to the, your questions, which for a lot of people is the most important part part. And then there's one more pop part, and we will switch to Zoom, and we'll be together, and Vinny may only be here a minute or two because he's given a lot of our time, but he promises maybe to be there shortly. In, do you yep. think you'll be I'm, in the Zoom a oh, little yeah. bit? I'm, I'm okay. there. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, let's transition to the questions. Uh, if you don't have a question, you can vote. And the uh, by the way, this system actually works a little bit better than the old one. So those of you that got frustrated that you voted a question and it didn't move up, uh, theoretically, or so I'm told, it does a better job. So Martin Brungard, uh, that's been a previous guest. Thank you, Martin. I'm glad you've joined us. So Martin asked the question, dry hopping tends to raise beer pH. Do you use a modifier and or adjust the beer pH when dry hopping? So I'm going to answer now. Of course. Yeah. Okay. So I make sure. I'm not sure if we're what the transition was. Yeah. So, um, so dry hopping does raise pH. Um, from academia, science world, they've pretty much everyone agrees that uh, per pound of dry hops per barrel, you're going to add about 0.1 to 0.14 pH. So it's pretty significant. So if you're if you dry hop at 4.4, your pH is at 4.4, and you dry hop at a pound per barrel, you're going to end up somewhere at 4.5, 4.55, somewhere in that range. So, you know, you get some of these little breweries that are dry hopping at like five, six, seven pounds per barrel, which does happen. You can really see how much. And now I don't know if there's a top limit that buffers because I've never dry hopped more than like five pounds per barrel. Um, that we just did for fun in the pilot brewery, but um, you definitely get a massive swing. And so we will uh, often make a pH adjustment in the uh, at the whirlpool. Uh, so at the end of the brewing process, we're you know we're where we should be in the mash, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4 tops, and then um, we're trying to be closer to like five, 5.1. Uh, going into the fermenter, we're going to get a pH drop through fermentation, but we will then look at the pH of the beer before dry hop and often make a phosphoric acid addition 
mix the tank up to get it homogenized, drop the pH, and then add the dry hops. And then we see the pH increase through dry hopping, that 0.1 to 0.14 per pound per barrel. Um, and then hopefully in the end, we still land under 4.6. 4.6 is a food safety number that at least in America, everyone should be focused on. No one's, no one's beer should be over 4.6. Um, technically, you're not food safe there. Um, and I personally like beer more in the 4.3, 4.4 uh, range. Um, but anyways, that's that's a personal preference. So yes, we do adjust pH with food grade phosphoric acid to account for the increase of pH by dry hopping. So can you put a scale, you said a massive change. Can you, can you put a range on that? So we have a little idea of, um, from the standpoint of, 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 uh, you mean just that you can see it swing high. Is that what you mean? Like on the pH? Well, I thought you were saying that when you dry hopped as, as Martin yeah. was asking that, that you could see a massive change and maybe I yeah. misunderstood it. Yeah, and no, 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 that's massive is a, is a, not a very quantifiable number. And I didn't know if you could put a number on it. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, we uh, got a beer from a um, brewery in California. They gave it, they sent us some beer. We gave us some beer. They were here, whatever it was. And it was a triple IPA or maybe it was quadruple IPA, if that's such a thing. And, um, we were tasting it in the lab and where we often just have these casual Friday tastings. And it's what I described as flabby and clumsy. And what I mean by that is it's like drinking a Chardonnay that's had too much malolactic fermentation. And it, it's just not crisp and acidic like a Sauvignon Blanc would be. And we we're like, gosh, man, that's really flabby. And it just didn't leave you wanting to drink more because it's not only bitterness that gives you that, but it's a dryness and it's polyphenols the beer probably was loaded with polyphenols so it wasn't that because the more dry hops the more polyphenols but anyways the ph is something to do with that so we ran it through our ph meter and it was it was 5.15 that's higher than we start our fermentations at often at like 5.1 sometimes a little bit lower and it was really shocking to see that so not only is that you know a flavor profile thing that we all didn't like personally but they were well above the 4.6, which is an FDA food safety uh, standard as well. So that's how high it could go. And I'm sure that beer was dry hopped with six or seven pounds per barrel because it, it was really hop aromatic and really smelled nice. But the finish, the flavor was just flabby, as I'll call it. So it sounds like almost two pH points. It, Yeah, I mean, hard to say where they started from and and again maybe there is a buffering point when you dry hop at that level because we've never tested that it would be an interesting test in our lab to see where if you know if you went to like seven or eight pounds per barrel that at some point it's maybe not 0.1 to 0.4 ph increase maybe it's 0.05 maybe it's like the bitterness you know you just can't keep adding hops on the hot side and you're not going to keep getting the same you know, increase in IBUs at some point, there's a saturation point and, and it might be the same there, but regardless, 5.15 is a really high for a, a, a finishing beer pH. All right, Martin, great question. Thank you for having the most popular one. The next most popular one is from Rodney. And Rodney asks, what is your mash temperature that gets you the best attenuation to Plato? And along with that, the phenomenal head retention. He said amazing, but I think it's phenomenal. <laughs> um, so we are, well, and there's something else that needs to be that tied to this, and that's um, the grist to liquor ratio, which I've spoken extensively on the um, Craft Beer and Brewing podcast. Um, and basically that we have found that you know, when you talk about mash temperature, you also also need to talk about um, liquor 
to gris ratio, your you know hot water. So we mash Pliny at um, 153 uh, Fahrenheit. That's the, the 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 regular temperature, and then we do a step to 162, and then we mash out at 168. Um, so basically 153. And but that could be different if your liquor to gris ratio is thinner or thicker. And you know there's a lot of conjecture here in the industry in that a lot of writings uh, in the academia writing in the beer industry says that a uh, thicker mash will see so we find that basically a thinner mash makes us a drier beer more fermentable and a thicker mash makes it more unfermentable and thus a sweeter beer but there's a lot of uh, brewing books out there that say the opposite and some very well-known brewing books and um, and this came up, like I said, recently on a, another podcast I was on, and it's just something we find in it and that we can control, um, the finish, the finishing gravity of a beer, not just by mash temperature and not just by adding dextrin malts, um, which we really try to stay away from now, but we can effectively like thin our mash out to make a beer drier, more fermentable or vice versa. And and we also find that when we're making a beer that we are trying to add body and mouthfeel to that when we're and it's a and it's a dry hot beer and we add uh, a dextrin malt like carapils that the carapils is broken down more easily by the enzymes in the malt as opposed to the dextrin malts that are created through a um, mash temp higher mash temperature or maybe a thicker mash. And so we've leaned on the mash thickness pretty regularly at Russian River. And it's a pretty fun tool in your toolkit. And I'd be curious to hear from others. And, and, and I have since those, those podcasts when I, I talked about that. Um, but, but, you know, we, we shoot for two play, two and a half Plato is our finishing gravity on, on Pliny. And, you know, we're, we're now doing a thicker mash with a, um, with the temperature that I just mentioned to try to achieve where we're at. And there's probably a million ways to, to do it. Um, you know, we've also adjusted our sugar additions because in, in general, our beers just became more fermentable when we went to the German brew house as well here in Windsor. So that was a fairly long answer. Could I get you to condense it? <laughs> yeah, said, sorry. Rod Rodney had the second most popular question. Yeah. So so basically it depends. You can't I don't think you can say like, you know, what's the what's the best attenuation if I'll say this, if your beers are too uh sweet, they're finishing too sweet and you need to and you want to dry them out more, whether it's two plate or two and a half, uh First, start with lowering your mash temperature. Uh, second, thin your mash out. Um, I, I don't want to go into details of, of this, but we did that with STS pills, our Pilsner. When we moved from our old brewery to the new one, it was too sweet finishing gravity here. And so we thinned the mash out. You can also let it sit longer and you'll have more enzymatic reaction. But we were trying to keep a certain amount of brews in a certain timeline. That STS pill is, is a nice beer, too. Thank you. That. All right. Thank you, Rodney. Good question. Uh, and Eric has the next question. He said, you added a little talus to the dry hops. And he put a question mark there, like maybe he misunderstood it. No, nope, he but was right. So, what kind of percentage are we talking about? 3%. And at, point, and at what point is it noticeable? Yeah, 3% was all it took. It's a tiny amount of, I, I pulled the recipe up. We're throwing, for a 75-barrel batch, we're throwing all of two pounds in, and it was noticeable that it lifted the citrus notes up of everything else. Think of it as cooking with saffron. You don't need a lot of saffron to affect your dish. Case expensive. I always think like New Zealand hops or the saffron or citras, the saffron of hops. But in this case, you just don't need a lot to contribute. And it just was 
a gut feeling I had that we had been using Talus and Natalie and I had been rubbing it in the field back way back when it was a experimental hop and it just had the most beautiful pink grapefruit. And I thought, man, if we can just get a little bit of that in a lighter hopped beer, lower hopped beer like Blind Pig to not only contribute a little bit of that pink grapefruit, but in the end, it ended up lifting all the other hops up. Like I, I think of Citra that way. It's the same reason we added a little bit of Citra to um, to to the Blind Pig uh, recipe a, a while ago. I'm looking at that, and that's a pretty small percentage as well. And that's that was again just to use a hop and more modern hop that has like this huge punch to it, which is amazing. Um, but we didn't want it to dominate. We didn't want it to become an all Citra beer. We still wanted the 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 you know other hops to you know, more old school hops to kind of still stand on their own and and so sometimes less is more well it, it goes back to and stan was talking about this in the last webinar the importance of just adding complexity and he was pointing out that we need a variety of hops and a variety of dates in which they're picked yep and we need to learn and understand that blending process to have even better beers. And, you know, another another just to trail on that before the next question of blending hops from a, a professional brewer standpoint is a good thing. Instead of making a beer with like one or two hop varieties, um, we often make our IPAs with six, seven, eight varieties. Yes, there's always one or two focused hops and then there's supporting hops. But what that does is it gives us the ability, if one hop has a bad year, that we can kind of trail that hop out of the recipe permanently or maybe temporarily, depending on what the situation is, and, and bring up one of the other hops without swaying the balance or the flavor profile too much. Um, a perfect example was in 2021, uh, we went up to hop selection. There was a lot of smoke in the air and um, maybe it was 2020, I'm forgetting, because there was smoke both 2020 and 2021. And we went to the farm that we buy our crystal hops from, which is a um, grossly underrated American hop um, that can have some really nice grapefruit notes in it. And we ended up selecting these hops or going to the selection table. And long story short, um, actually it was 2020 because it was during the pandemic. And everything smelled like smoke. And so we had to reject the hops. So we didn't buy any crystal hops. I immediately got on the phone, bought as much of the previous crop year as I could, but it didn't come close to filling our contract. And so long story short, we were able to use some other hops in higher quantity to make up for the crystal that we lost. So a variety of hops in the hop bill um, is actually pretty important. And you, you see that with Anheuser-Busch, even with Budweiser. It has a ton of hop varieties in it. Well, it, I think it's a great point because we need to be creative with what, whoops, wrong button. <laughs> I will get it right eventually. Uh, because they do vary per year. I know uh, I end up at Sierra fairly often because uh, their Mills River facility is close by. And it's always interesting to hear people's reaction year to year on celebration. And they go, oh, well, you know, this is not as good as the previous year or this is better than the previous year. But you can't mimic previous years, right? Because it's no. uh, it, it's it's totally different. It's an agricultural product. Agricultural product. Yeah. Good answer. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Good question. Uh, we get we get the same thing every year with younger, except with younger, oh. we're always changing the recipe. So. <laughs> we have about thirty minutes left, and I'm going to wing it. I think that looks like about seven questions. Uh, Ken has the next question. Do you ever use pellet hops or hop extracts? Yep. So, uh, we, um, we use lots of hop extract. We are well known in the craft beer industry to be one of the very, very first, uh, early adopters of using hop extract. Um, this is back in 1999, I think was when I first used hop extract and, so the both the uh, elder, younger, DDH, blind pig, they all get hop extract um, in the uh, bittering edition. 
And now uh, we are just recently starting to experiment with uh, some of the incognito. Um, and we've messed around with a little bit with Spectrum, uh, which are both John I. Haas products. And then Yakima Chief has their new 702 uh, uh, product coming out, which are varietal. Those are all varietal hop uh, extracts that are higher oil content. So I call them high oil hop extracts is, is kind of what um, we, we, how we call them out here compared to more traditional hop extracts that are usually just used at the beginning of the boil that which, which I mentioned initially for bittering for Pliny pig, DDH, so on and so forth. <clears throat> so, so we're just starting to experiment with these high oil extracts, which you would add in the whirlpool or even in the dry hop. And so the advantage here is you're reducing all the green matter that has been reduced down into an extract form. You do get a higher alpha acid content, but that seems to work itself out just through the small amount that we're adding. Um, and those are really interesting as well. In fact, this Saturday, for the first time, we'll be using it on a 20-barrel batch at our Santa Rosa brewery. And then we plan to keep expanding up with it, using more of it and learning how they are in our pilot brewery. And then eventually, you know, maybe use them on some big batches here in our 75 barrel brew house. But you get a lot of efficiency from, from extract. But you do use whole cone hops, right? We do. Yeah. Yeah. We use whole cone hops uh, in the uh, hop back uh, here at our Windsor facility. And so it, it's um, definitely takes a little extra space to store the hops because a 50 pound box is much larger than the small 44 pound box of pellets. That's pretty much a similar quantity reduced down. And so, yeah, we use hop uh, extract, as I mentioned, we use uh, whole cone hops, the most traditional old school way of hops on the hot side and the hot back. We use conventional pellets, which are called T90, and then we use concentrated hops, which in the old days would be called T45s. But now you've got Yakima Chief with Cryo and Crosby with CGX and um, Haas and Steiner both have theirs as well. I won't go on and on with them, but they're all branded different names. But in short, they're concentrated pellets, meaning that a T90 pellet has 90% of the green matter, T45 has 50%, but 50% uh, less, but it has more alpha acids and more oils because they've been concentrated and then you dry hop with that and it does give you a different aroma and flavor. Um, and it also yields you more beer because you're having to add less dry hops to hopefully get the same result, albeit those hops cost, cost twice as much and then some. But if you can yield more beer, then you should be ahead on that math equation when you're talking about finances and beer. Yeah. When hoppy beers comes around, there's a lot on the finances. So how does that, how do you decide <clears throat> if you had a, a choice, I can either get whole cones of this, or I can get pellets of this, all the same hops or extract or cryo. Is there a strategy in which you would pick one form over another? For us, whole cone is always on the hot side because we don't have the ability to use them on the cold side, say like Sierra Nevada has with their torpedo external tank dry hopping device. So whole cone is always there. Um, extract used to be only on the hot side, um, but now, as I said, we're monkeying around with using it on the cold side. And those are some techniques we've learned from some of our uh, you know, younger brewery owner friends that are doing some really innovative stuff. Um, but when you come down to, let's just say dry hopping, cause that's the focus today, you need to find the right balance of the regular T90 pellets and the concentrated pellets because you, you lose some of the fullness of the hop that the, uh, concentrated hops, if you use hundred percent concentrated hops on the dry hop, it just is missing something, the aroma. You'll hear a lot of brewers tell you this that have used the concentrated hops a lot that you still need to blend in some percentage of t90 pellets to get a fullness in the hop aroma and the flavor that the dry hop adds there's no right or wrong answer this is this that's the art of brewing and that's the difference between 
one brewery to the other. And if you were to give them the marching order to make a beer with, you know, whatever hop combination, they would end up with something totally different because one brewer is going to believe that maybe it needs to be 50, 50. And the other one's going to say it needs to be 75, 25, one way or the other. Well, and your answer might be with it's an agricultural product. <laughs> yeah, it comes down to that too. Yeah. <laughs> you also, okay. you also when you when you have whole cone hops, you see them in their most pure format. And there's yeah. something really um old school about that. And you know, we break apart every for the tens of thousands of pounds of whole of whole cone hops, and that's nothing compared to Sierra Nevada. Um, we break every pound apart by hand to break them apart and, and make sure that one, there's no foreign material in there, but two, just so when they're added in, they're getting the best contact with the, with the, the wart and, and Sierra does the same thing. This is nothing, this is nothing new for whole cone breweries. Yeah. I've seen it. I've heard some stories about what they sometimes find. In no. those let's not, <laughs> let's not go there. And birds and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it is pretty important, but yeah, they break them up yeah. too. Yeah. Well, Ken, that was a great question. We'll move on to the next one. Uh, the next most popular question, uh, Darman, and I hope I got that close. Please forgive me if I didn't. Uh, so our question from Darman is, can you share some insights into your timing and temperatures of your dry hop additions? Yeah. So for Blind Pig and Pliny and Happy Hops, the other IPA that I call our not so hazy, hazy IPA that I sent you, those all uh, dry hop after fermentation. So they finish fermentation in four days or so, three, four days, um, five days maybe. And then a day or two later, we'll drop the cone, grab as much yeast out as possible, and then we'll add the the dry hops and maybe there's a pH addition, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so that's our conventional method. With DDH, we're adding the first dry hop three days into fermentation, so mid ferment, for mid fermentation, and then we add the second dry hop a few days after that. And that mid fermentation dry hop is something that we've done on Pliny the Younger since the very first batch of younger we ever made in 2005. So that's nothing new to us, but from an industry standpoint, that's really one of the techniques that hazy IPA brought to the table was that mid fermentation dry hop. And that, you know, there's, there's this buzzword biotransformation that often probably gets used a little too much and might be a little bit more of a marketing term, just like DDH these days, but there is something, there is an interaction between hops and yeast and there's a couple different types of biotransformation that that can go on um but for us we're mostly focused on the thiols which are sulfur compounds that are measured in parts per trillion and it said that you know a drop in a swimming pool you could smell olympic size swimming pool is i think how tom nielsen from sierra says it so so it depends on the beer and a lot of times this is a is a way for us to create a new flavor with different hops so that all of our IPAs just don't taste the same. So it's not only changing the hop varieties, but we're changing the process. I will add that sometimes when we add too early in the process, we get a, li a lot of uh, uh, onion, garlic, sulfur compounds that, that just don't blow off. And, and I know that uh, Laura at Omega Yeast has done some research where maybe adding your hops maybe a day later in the process uh, for your hazies uh, might give you better uh, haze stability as compared to adding them early on. Um, there's some pretty cool research that that they've done on on that. And, um, there's some other podcasts that you can listen to that that talk about that. So um, so we're you know it's, it's why we have a five barrel pilot brewery is to experiment with these things. And a lot of times we will we won't necessarily try to rebrew Pliny or Blind Pig on the, on the pilot brewery. We'll just brew a standard recipe that I have in there. It's a 7% IPA recipe that I brew a lot of times. And we're going to test concepts in there. And then if we, if we like the concept, we'll then apply it to a batch at the pub first, maybe not Pliny right off the bat, but something else. And if we really like it, maybe over time it will incorporate into one of our mainline beers like Blind Pig or Pliny. 
Okay, I can't let it pass. You said biotransformation might be more of a marketing term. Now, that's it, my question. Why is biotransformation more of a marketing term? <laughs> it, it, it's a term that gets thrown around a lot by brewers. And, and I'll be the first to admit that I don't understand it in and of myself. Um, and, 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 I, and you hear brewers just say, oh, well, I, you know, I get the yeast in and uh, hop contact. But honestly, they do it without any scientific background. And again, it's, it's no knock on, on those brewers. I mean, like I said, I used to call that dryness that we got from dry hopping perceived bitterness. And that was just a term that I came up with. And now I know really what it is. But, but you just hear it all the time. And, and I often wonder if that over-the-top hop flavor that they're getting is really um, just the fact that they're adding four pounds per barrel and it's just a ton of hops that they're that they're adding in um and and we don't have the capabilities at our lab to measure these things i mean you have to you have to get to a brewery like sierra nevada that has the ability to measure thiols and and that sort of thing so um it it's it's just a and, and my point when I said that was just that it's a term that's easy to throw out there that gets consumers that are really into beer like, oh, yeah, I mean, thiols are that word right now. Everyone mentions thiols right now. Just say just say thiol and, you know, you'll you'll get a beer enthusiast listening. What, what was that? Thiols, I want to know. And, and there's still so much to be to be learned on it. And, um, and so I, I just feel like it gets thrown around just a little too much. Just like DDH does, you know, we've we've thrown it on one brand, one can bottle, DDH Pliny, and that's it so far. We use it on some other beers, but we don't talk about it because I don't want it to become just this. Oh yeah, it'd be double dry hop. You know, we've, I mean, as Natalie will say, like we've been double, triple, and quadruple dry hopping since 2005, and actually beyond since the first beer I ever made at Blind Pig had mold in 1994, the inaugural ale, which is kind of the known to be the first double IPA that had multiple dry hop additions. So it's something we've been playing around with for years, decades. So, so essentially you're saying the term bio transformation is not measurable. Uh, unless you have a crazy lab, like I'm, I'll keep going back to Sierra Nevada because I know them well. Um, unless you have a crazy lab, I mean, the the to get without getting like too over the top you know in the weeds of science but up until sierra nevada bought their most recent um piece of lab instrument that could measure uh thiols the only place that you could go to for that was this company in france so we're a member of the hop quality group uh founding member and we would send our samples to France to be measured for these thiols because no one in America could do it. Sierra Nevada decided to invest in that equipment. And so now the Hop Quality Group hires Sierra to do the work and they're a member as well. Um, but that's how difficult these things are to, to measure. No, but I, I think that puts great perspective because I've certainly heard biotransformation a lot. Yeah. And for somebody like you, <laughs> as you pointed out, who's been dry hopping and all kind of different hoppings for all these years that you question it. Yeah. And, and I don't, I don't want to degrade, out. I don't want to degrade the breweries that are, you know, throwing it around. Cause yeah. you know what, I've, I've talked about it too. And, and there, there is something that goes on, but yeah. I don't understand it yet. And, and it's really, and I, and I think if you talked, if you spoke to, let's say Mitch Steele or, you know, someone, who has an extensive background, but doesn't have a lab, you know, such as Sierra Nevada does, um, he would, I'm going to guess would have the same answer that, that I do. And, um, and that's okay. You know, it's, it also like promotes these new terms, terminology and a new vocabulary to the beer community. And we can learn together as, you know, as we move forward. So I missed, I also missed on that question temperature. Um, 
we we dry hop at 68 Fahrenheit most of the time. Where we are messing around with a cooler fermentation temperature now, and then dry hop and let it free rise up. But we're 64 to 68 degrees. We there is some uh, brewers out there that dry hop colder, and but we we just personally find that when we dry hop an American West Coast IPA cold, let's say 52 or lower. We get more herbal notes and it's not that fresh fruity citrus that we're looking for and that's just our experience maybe someone else because they remove more yeast or whatnot they're getting a different um, result all right well that was great quick i just had to ask that and i feel embarrassed that as an engineer i've really i've just kind of with somebody said biotransformation i never thought about measuring it and that's just that's not me and I'm a bit of a cynic, so thank you. I, you put up, you put up my antennas. <laughs> you could, you could probably do a whole like presentation on biotransformation with, you know, a number of many folks in the industry that are definitely more lab and science focused than I am, um, and it would be fascinating. Well, Dr. Laura Burns has. We're talking to her, so maybe. Maybe she can help us with yeah, that one out back. Yeah, and, she, and then she can throw in the whole thing with their uh, yeast, their thialized yeast and yep. that whole thing, yep. which I'll just leave it there as a carrot for the viewers. Well, uh, Mr. Drew Beecham has our next question. And uh, Drew, uh, it gives me a good opportunity. I know you're going to be at HomebrewCon, and I think there's some others maybe get, that are going to be at HomebrewCon. I'll be at HomebrewCon. And so if you want to see Drew, uh, you want to endure me, <laughs> I would love to see you if you're going to be at HomebrewCon. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, and that'll be a lot of fun. And, and maybe, Drew, I can corner you on saisons because I want to talk about those. That's a, right. that's, a, that's a common theme between the three of us. We all love saisons. Drew, <laughs> Drew and I know that we each love saisons, and I know that about you as well. Well, and I've had some mighty good ones, uh, but yours is was your Brett one was awesome. Okay, anyway, so let's get to Drew's question. What do you think of the role of thiols in West Coast IPAs? You know, I I think they're depending on variety. Um, I think they're they're definitely going to be there. I'm going to say that in general, they're probably in a lot of beers. We just need to figure out ways to measure it, especially as a smaller brewery that doesn't have a lab. Um, you know, perfect example is there are uh, some thiols uh, in Simcoe hops. Simcoe hops have a lot of thiols, but there's been some work also done that Cascade has a lot of, and when you talk about thiols, you have uh, free and bound thiols. Free thiols are basically those thiols, aroma compounds that are just readily available, and then you have the bound version that you somehow have to unlock, with, whether it's through glycosides um, or enzymes in your yeast or whatever it is. Um, and, uh, and so, like, we know that Simcoe has that contribution, um, but it's now recently been researched that cascades are just full of, of bound thiols. So, better to almost use them on the hot side and then have them carry through into your fermentation and then if you do truly have biotransformation maybe the yeast is opening up unbinding those thiols and the cascade hops and making and liberating them is how i like to say and making them available and then become that becomes a part of your fermentation process i mean it's it's the wonder of fermentation and that why beer will always be continually researched and will not truly ever know it just so happens that we are in the age of thiols right now. And so, yes, they contribute massively to hazy IPA and all that beautiful, juicy aroma. But I think there's a part of West Coast and even some old school hops that that are, are going to you, we're going to continue to find that. They can be unlocked. Well, that brings us uh, to an important part in what we're doing here. We are literally 10 minutes away. And just like the gas pump, when you only put in a certain amount of dollars, I have a hard stop and I'm going to warn you at the, at the end. So we have about 10 questions and we have about 10 minutes. So we're going to have to do these rapid fire, Vinny. Okay. Uh, and I mean, I'm we can carry it. over to the Zoom, but 
it would be real nice if we could answer it here. Yeah. So thank you, Drew. Great question. I want to follow up because we were talking about West Coast IPA definitions. So you uh, you help fill in that void. So thank you yeah. for that. We will see you at HomebrewCon. Steve Morgan has our next question. Could you use Dysket, Dysteticus yeast to achieve the same results as adding sugar to further, fuller, uh, further attenuate the beer? Gracious. Yeah. Um, so there's different types of, first off, Dystaticus yeast is, Sorry. Um, yeah, that's all good. I can keep talking. Dystaticus yeast is yeast that has an basically an enzyme that has the ability to just break through the long chain sugars and ferment the beer drier. And so there are different levels of Dystaticus yeast and some will stop at say half a degree Play-Doh. Like our Saison yeast, it ferments to zero. So it's a slippery slope, particularly as a, um, as a professional brewer, because if some of that yeast gets into the bottle or can, we may see a secondary fermentation. So if you wanted to, in, in lieu of a diastaticus yeast, um, as because I assume your the question was regarding to how to dry the beer out, you know, to further attenuate the beer, instead of using a diastaticus yeast, what I would suggest is using like an Amelo um, Brewer Supply Group sells Amelo 300, um, and it's an enzyme that you add to the mash. And then you're going to have to monkey around with the volume that you use, but just through trial and error. But through that, you can then get to a drier place if you didn't want to use sugar, or maybe you're using sugar and you just still aren't getting the beer as dry as you want it to be. Um, because why that would work better, in my opinion, and we do this with some of our Belgian beers, is that then you're going to denature that enzyme in the boil. And you won't have to worry about it continuing to break down the long chain sugars, which is basically what hop creep is. Right. And you kept it to about one minute. <laughs> You're on it. Thank you, Steve. Great question. Martin has the next question. Can you please tell us where you got the yeast for the first blind pig? Yeah. So that white labs, pizza port, Salona beach, or and talk about the IPAs in those early days. Wow, that's a long answer. Yeah, yeah. So that came, uh, Feast actually came from, it wasn't White Labs, it was Chris White. Chris was getting his PhD in something at uh, University of San Diego or UCSD, University of California, San Diego in La Jolla. And so I would drive down from Temecula. I would call him ahead of time. Uh, and that was before cell phones. You know, he'd tell me that, you know, hey, I need yeast a week later. He would say, okay, yeast is ready. I drive up there. There was a mobile gas station. It looked like a drug deal. Uh, I'd call him from the payphone. I drive up the hill. I was in my tan Toyota pickup. He'd hand me a brown bag of yeast that I'd shove in my ice chest, and I'd give him a wad of cash. And that was that. He was busy doing his his uh, PhD or whatever it was, and I needed to get back and brew. But uh, Solana Beach fits in there because Solana Beach, as well as Home Brew Mart, were Chris's first customers just as when he was in the lab there at, at UCSD. And then I was, I was Chris's third customer. And uh, yeah, to talk about the early IPAs, we actually just rebrewed inaugural ale, our first double IPA recipe from Blind Pig from 94. And people love to taste that old school, you know, uh, flavor and aroma. Um, to me, when I drink that beer, it's like a time machine. It takes me back to 1994 because it has all the same flavors that I remember it, albeit we're using a more modern brew house now. But um, but our our guests are interested in having that comparison. They like the more modern style with everything that we've talked about today, but they also want to go back. And I think it's important to remember what beers tasted like back then. Well, we're actually, uh, Martin, I'm trying to press, uh, excuse me, Chris, I'm trying to pressure into doing a webinar. Yeah. So. If you had a good time, Benny, let him know. It's not I so will. bad. Okay. <laughs> Jeff has the next question. How would you adjust the recipe for Pliny and other beers to accommodate seasonal variations in the availability of hops and other ingredients? I know you've already answered this pretty well, but are there further thoughts? There's one, one further thought I want to throw out there, and that's that, yes, it's an agricultural product. Let's just focus on hops. Um, a lot of times I hear some of my friends in the industry say, when I go do hop selection each year, I want to have a blank slate and I don't know which farms or what region, it could be Oregon, Washington, Idaho. I have a, I have a different view. Uh, Natalie and I, when we go do hop selection, 
I like the fact that our Simcoe, uh, that, you know, we have three sources of Simcoe. One of them comes from Peralt every year and one always comes from Carpenter because we buy them direct. And then our third one comes from YCH and that could be a, a mix. But even then I hone it down into a, a few farms. And I like that because that gives me consistency because I know the farm has consistent farm practices. And at the end of the day, the common theme is that these farms have amazing hop varieties. So, or, you know, quality hops. And so that's, that's a different approach that we take that I'd like having the sameness every year. Maybe it's not the same field every year, but ironically, like at Peralt, Steve and Jason will always put this one field in. I can't remember the number. And a lot of years, Natalie and I always pick it. And, and so there is consistency, not only in the farm, but sometimes the field as well. And that's us smelling those blind. And we're still picking the same field every year. And in some years we won't pick it. And Steve will, Peralt will be like, well, that's weird. You usually always pick field, whatever the number is. Well, that's good that you're not consistent and that predictable. Yeah. <laughs> so is that you or Natalie? Uh, it's both of us. She has a better <laughs> nose than me. I'll, I'll always say that. It's true. So. I hope she's not mad at me because I kept you a little bit late in the interview uh, in, no, no. in Nashville. She's, she's, it was all good. <laughs> all right. Jeff, great question. Let's, we'll move on. Uh, and just so you know, we're probably three and a half minutes. Uh, Joshua asks a really good question because I'm a barley wine or at least English barley wine fan. Have you ever brewed a pre-Russian River barley wine? What is that? Yeah, we did it at Blind Pig. It was uh, called uh, Old Blue Granite, and that was uh, 1994, 95, 96. We did them every quarter by season, so you know, spring, summer, so on and so forth. Um, and we on occasion make a barley wine, but honestly, Plenty of the Younger was a replacement for barley wine for us. We were looking for a way to kind of push the envelope with uh, IPA in, in lieu of making a barley wine. And so we do on occasion make a barley wine. Will we ever brew it again? Yeah, we will. Um, it's not at the front of my, you know, list of brews that I'm looking to make. Um, what I more prefer to focus on is something that I'm brewing on and off in our pilot brewery as an ongoing project is Belgian quadruple. I love that style when it's done right, fermented dry, but big fruitiness. And so personally, I would more rather focus on a Belgian quad over a barley wine. I, I'm fine with barley wines, but I'm just a more, I'm, I'm a bigger quad Belgian quad fan. So do you make all your barley wines English or more American focused? Uh, done it both ways. Old, old blue granite was English. Um, old Goobly Gotch, our barley wine from Russian River was American. I must say I prefer the English style. <laughs> or at least for the ones I've tried, but I hadn't yeah. had one of yours, so I might change my mind. Uh, we are down to a little, little less than two minutes. And so this might be our last question from TT. TT asks, in my IPAs, I've frequently found hop aroma to be amazing while the flavor falls somewhat flat. Is there a basis for this and any suggestions to improve? It's, you know, when I talked about two and a half Play-Doh as a finishing gravity for us, maybe it's different for you or another brewer. I find that when we are under two and a half Play-Doh, especially if we're down at like that two range, um, that we have less hop flavor in the mouthfeel. And it's almost like we need a little bit of that residual sugar to carry through. And, you know, then if you think about a hazy IPA, granted, they're using probably even more hops, but those are typically finishing at a higher terminal gravity that maybe that's carrying more of that quality too. Another thought is to add some haze to your beer because uh, I'm spacing on the compound um, that comes from the interaction between proteins and polyphenols to create the haze. But, you know, the, the, those higher proteins from oats and wheat and whatnot almost act as an emulsif emulsifier. And uh, xanthohumulone is what they are. And that's some of the research that academia has done that we now know that that carries some of the, that umptuous hop and the hoppy and fruity and juiciness that hazies have. And so what I wanna do is figure out how do we add that to a clean West Coast beer. Vinny, we're literally 20 seconds from ending. I wanna thank you. For the in on behalf of the whole audience 
I hope you can join the Zoom call. I hope others yeah. will join the Zoom call. I've got it there in the chat. We will literally end in five seconds. It's not very clean, but thank you so much. And cheers, my friend. Cheers. Thanks. It was fun. Thank you. That was great. Well, that's interesting. It didn't end. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, let's finish. That's the first time. Maybe the new platform allows me a little more time. <laughs> we can keep going. I got time. Natalie already went home to feed the cat. So, uh, wow. <laughs> and I think she's picking up dinner to go. I don't, I don't quite know how to act. Anyway, that caught me off guard. Uh, well, let's go ahead. If you're game before we yeah, jump game. to Zoom, we'll finish these yeah. last questions. Okay, so there is a feature with the new platform I didn't know about. Uh, Rob asks, uh, what liquor grist ratio do you prefer? Yeah, so it's going to be different. For our IPAs, we might be as, um, you know, like point, like on the pilot brewery, sometimes I'm at a quarter gallon of, or 0.26 gallons per uh, pound of grain. Um, if I'm going to have a really heavily high, a high dry hop load. So I'm trying to create some dextrin still so that I don't get a beer that finishes below two and a half Play-Doh. But for our uh, loggers, we're often at like 0.37, I believe is, is the number. So a pretty thin mash to promote more flowable liquid to grain contact. And then those enzymes are going to be able to do their thing and we're going to make a more fermentable, um, a wart stream and so it does vary but it is a tool in our toolkit that we use quite a bit these days and but if i had to say like for our ipas where do we average we're probably at 0.3 gallons per pound of grain well you've intrigued me uh more flowable liquid i know uh dick kent well and i were having a little bit of a discussion on some things i was trying and he said my mash was too thick so flowable liquid dick saying is too thick talk about that just a minute yeah so it really um it really comes down to it, at least this is my um you know take on it is that if you have too thick of a mash and so you don't have as much liquid in there compared to the to the grain of volume you're going to end up um with not having like free flowing uh, liquid, which is, you know, and which is also kind of allowing the, um, the enzymes to do their thing. And so it, it's just, it's again, like I said earlier, science and, and a lot of academia says one thing, but I'm, I'm, I'm of the mindset that it really, um, that the thinner the mash, the more fermentability you get. And, um, you know, again, I could be off base, but what we, what we see here at Russian river is that we want to have a thinner mash when we're trying to make a drier beer. Well, you're consistent at least with Dick Cantwell. <laughs> yeah. And I was, I was, me. I was Dick's <laughs> assistant brewer at, uh, he, he has a one barrel system and, he and Kim live nearby us and uh, now in Sonoma County. And I've uh, heard about that. So he's got it up and running. Yeah. So I was, I was his, uh, I was his first uh, assistant brewer, which was fun. Well, I asked him if I was going to be invited to see it and he said, no media. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was his take. Yeah. There, I don't think there were any pictures uh, when we, uh, <laughs> when, when we, when we brewed. I, I got to work on that, but anyway, Okay, Rob, great question. Let's move to the rest of them so we can get to the Zoom. I like John's question. Since we're talking about thiols and omega, and I assume he's referring to omega yeast. Yeah. Have you played around with the thialized, thialized yeast or phantasm? We have messed around a little bit with thialized yeast. Um, We've actually used more of the ALDC yeast, alpha lactoacido decarboxylase um, from Berkeley yeast, which that only they only make thialized yeast or modified, genetically modified yeast, because that ALDC basically helps reduce diacetyl. It doesn't get rid of it completely. 
Um, and then we've tried a couple fermentations with Omega, with um, their California ale yeast version of thialized yeast. And it's honestly not something that I found to be um, like just a earth changing, earth shattering for me. Um, maybe because, you know, what we're doing with our hoppy beers is already so hoppy that we don't need to 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 do that um you know they all say that it's interesting on lower alcohol beers and and that you get more expression there and um in the in some of those stuff we did i just found it to be a little bit artificial i've had some really beautiful beers with thialized yeast so i think it's a matter of just messing around with it more but um i i have a a little bit of a of a of, of a more of a philosophical question of, of this and that's that you know do you tell the consumer this and you know the the hop or the yeast companies tell us that we're getting the yeast that basically has been genetically modified but is are we telling the consumer that and so i i struggle with that and because of that we haven't used it that much because i know where we're at here in sonoma county it would definitely be a, a an issue if we were using it regularly, not telling our consumer. So you're not using thialized yeast. So we're not. No, we're not using them. Now we tested it yeah. a couple times, and we haven't we haven't gone back. Well, I can understand that. Let's let's move to the next one. Ryan asked the question, what is the next beer you and Natalie are working on for your anniversary release? Oops, oh. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. There you Wrong go. button. There we go. Yeah, that's all good. Um, you know, we're not working on anything specific for an anniversary release. Um, it's uh, more just... Pilot Brewery is always just about processes and concepts, and it's it's sometimes about a brand new recipe from scratch. And I already said this earlier that we're more interested in testing something on this seven percent IPA. When we're talking about hoppy beer, and then applying it to other beers. And so maybe we're you know going to come up. Yeah, we are going to come up with like a new planning for president recipe, but. Um, we're more testing concepts individually and then rolling them into one eventually. So nothing, nothing specific for anniversary. All right. That didn't work either. Like I planned. <laughs> <laughs> You're learning. Yeah. I, uh, unfortunately on your nickel, uh, not, yeah. not really, but kind of, okay. So gosh, this print is tiny. Lewis. All right. Lewis asks, what's the best way to avoid astringency in heavy dry heart hop beer? Um, I, yeah, I would, I would suggest, um, is to one, not run your, uh, your wart runoff too low in gravity. Um, and one little trick you could do is, is what the industry affectionately calls cool pool. So you basically high gravity brew, your beer in the kettle and uh, i'll just throw this in some simple numbers of we take six barrels to the kettle in our pilot brewery in hopes of getting five barrels of wort to the fermenter um, and we'll do that but the grain bill is actually a higher volume of of malt and then after the end of the boil we'll add i'm just going to throw out a barrel of water so we're going to dilute the wort back to what the gravity should be. And so what that does is your final runnings of your uh, wort out of your mash louder ton or louder ton, whatever it is, um, is a higher gravity. And so you are throwing some sugar away, but you're also not extracting any heavy tannins or, or whatnot. And so that's that would be one thing that I would suggest. And then another thing is also looking at your bittering hop addition. There is this thing called uh, cohumulin that um, is it, it's conjecture in the in the beer and hop industry whether 
Cohimi alone really means something um, and that a lower CoH to people, as, as it's often said, um, will give you a cleaner bitterness and then a higher CoH will give you a more harsh bitterness. That's probably up to you because that also has to do with what your terminal gravity is also. So, um, but I would start with, if you think you're getting too astringent of a beer, um, start with there. If it's coming from your dry hop load, which was kind of, which was what the question was, you might need to let your beer age out longer, like lager, longer, cold, once you're past hop creep. Uh, you could also lower your hop bill. There is such a thing as adding too much hops and just, and you're just throwing money away. Um, and then also you might want to dump your cone fat quicker. So you dry hop, you know, today, instead of waiting 48 hours to drop the cone, if, if you have the ability to do that, or maybe rack it, um, maybe drop it at 24 hours, drop the cone. If you have that ability to dump the cone, this also gets into the pellet density and whether your pellets are too dense and they just sink through and they're almost pellets at the bottom, or they're not dense enough and they just float at the pat at the top. And as, as my friend Evan from green cheek says, he calls it the lily pad effect It's something we've actually just been texting and emailing about recently. So I think that's worthy of a summary. How would you summarize avoiding astringency in heavily dry hot beer? Yeah, I would, I would start with potentially having a higher, um, using a cool pool. So start your, um, stop your runoff earlier and then dilute it down. And that starts the process of, of making a less astringent beer right from the get go. But if you know that it's coming from your dry hops, you either need to, um, you know, drop the cone uh, quicker, uh, or probably use less hops as, as well would be, would be something it's amazing lowering the dry hop load, what that does. You can get oftentimes the same aroma and use less hops. I know that's like, it's, it's so non-American if little is good, lots better. That's a good, no, well, I would call it non-intuitive, but yes, yeah, it is non-American yeah. too. <laughs> All right, uh, we got one last question, and Ryan, maybe you can ask your question in the Zoom that we're going to transition to in just a moment. Uh, but Thomas, I think, has a good way to kind of wrap this up. Uh, and again, uh, I, I thought we were going to have a rather unceremonious end. Again, I'm trying <laughs> a new platform, and used to be I had a flat two hours. Uh, it turns out I think I have a little more time than I knew. Anyway, so Thomas asks... What is your desert island beer? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I typically go with when I get to ask this question. I typically go with Orval, which is a Brett finished beer, um, and I go with that because Brett finished beers change over time. They're very drinkable. I love Orval, um, and so if you're on a desert island and you only had one beer somehow you're getting that supply of it and it's got Britannomyces in the bottle conditioning. It's constantly changing. So it's almost like you're drinking a different beer every day. I'm trying to throw right in here our chat or our Zoom that's following up. And there we go. Well, good. This is awesome. We don't have an unceremonious end. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to transition. Everybody might need a moment between uh, Zoom starts up, so please allow a minute or two for it to fire up. I've put the link. Uh, it should say bit.ly dot uh, gourmet dash hangout. Uh, Vinny, I know you've spent a lot of time with us. If you need to go, I understand it. If you can take five minutes with us, that would be great. Yeah. Maybe we can answer the last few questions there. So yeah, hope to do see we need to, in the Zoom. So we need to basically copy that link and then start it back up. That's what we'll have to do. We'll have to literally Perfect. transition, but it'll be a Zoom call. And so I hope everybody will come. And for those that leave, and we had what fifteen seventy five registered for this. For those of you that have to leave, and I understand, huge opportunity to get to Zoom with uh, Vinny. But if not, we thank you for taking so much time. Vinny, we thank you for taking 
so much time. You and I have been talking about this for years, yeah. and I'm thrilled to have a chance. And and look at this beautiful lineup of beers that I've got down here. Uh, just awesome. So well, that was I want fun. To thank I you appreciate for it. that, too. And I'm going to try and hit the right button there. There we go. <laughs> we'll, we'll transition to Zoom in just a moment. Hope to see everybody there. Thank you, Vinny. Cheers. Yep, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. See you in a minute.